What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be covering some more memory cleanup and streaming of levels and unstreaming of levels in our game so that we can have a more fluid experience when we are going from different menus and stages. So specifically in today's episode, we're going to go over how we can safely quit to the main menu under all circumstances and how we can perform rematches without the camera boundaries being in the way at the start of the round. We're gonna fix up a lot of logic that which is slightly off, wasn't quite there. And it's all gonna be related to streaming, unstreaming, and performing rematches and keeping track of all our data properly. So say I come into my game and I beat up my opponent and I decide I wanna be able to go back to the main menu. At this case, and this time I can actually do this and I am back at the main menu with most of the actors deleted. Now I can go back into verses, I can set my characters again, I can go to my stage and I can select a different stage as well if I want. And it will load properly. Now this should have been working from the level streaming episodes, but there were some things that just weren't quite right. Some of the controls weren't right, some of the characters weren't being possessed again properly. Sometimes the lighting would be off. There were a lot of little things here and there that were just slightly wrong because the actual streaming in unstreaming and actors being deleted wasn't completely finished now we have some more updates we're still not completely finished because there are some things in here that are more specific to to certain features for example i have not cleaned up the extra player controllers that get spawned so they kind of just linger and i was going to do that in today's episode but the problem is if we just clean them up it kind of ruins the auto detection of controllers so we need that next episode of auto detection of controllers to get this functioning properly so it will actually be included in that episode but this is going to get us a lot closer to our final result before we get started i want to give a huge shout out to my youtube membership and patreon members and supporters thank you guys for all the love and support i am so incredibly grateful about everything you've done for me and for the series I'm so happy I get to share this with you every week, and I hope you guys are enjoying. Alright, to get started in this episode, we need to get caught up in what we've done to get to this point. If you'd like to check out all the episodes we've done to get to this point, I'll link you to the entire playlist right here of the Fighting Game Tutorial series. We are on episode 156, so we're pretty far along. We still have a lot to do, but each episode is getting a large amount of improvements, and I'm pretty happy about that. Alternatively, if you don't care about that, but you do care about memory management, level streaming, some of the topics we're going over today, I will link you to the first episode where we covered the level streaming. It is very useful for what we're going to be going over today because a lot of the logic is shared or stems off of what we'll be covering. We're just going to be enhancing it, upgrading it a little bit. With that said, we can go ahead and get started on today's episode. There are going to be a few minor code changes, but the majority of it's going to be done in either the blueprints or the widgets themselves. So I'm going to start off by going into the main menu level blueprint. So since we are using level streaming, we have our persistent level and all these sub levels under it that we stream in and stream out. So if you go to your blueprints, sub levels and edit main menu, we can go to our main menu level blueprint. Now this is what our main menu level blueprint looks like. It is pretty much the same as you saw before. I just messed up the order on two things and I also need to avoid doing something when we're specifically streaming the main menu. So the main menu spawns a main menu screen widget, which is a just the widget for the main menu, right? But the main menu itself has a level because in this level we can do things like spawn actors for the character select, spawn things for the stage select so we have a lot of potential here to do different things with the main menu that don't have to do with the specific main menu widget when we do return to the main menu from the pause menu or from ending a match or whatever the case may be we want to respawn the main menu screen widget so one thing we were never doing when we were returning to the main menu was calling this function this event that's one thing we actually weren't doing. We were doing it, and then it got taken out due to some other things, and now I want to finalize it and put it where it should actually be. And the other thing is where we were destroying our camera. 
So we destroy our cameras as we go from scene to scene or level to level, which makes sense because we have different cameras for each stage. However, the main menu camera is unique because it's not a fighting game camera, right? We have our, our default camera is what it's called in the game, in, in my files. We have that camera that locks onto the players and moves when they move, but this is not that type of camera. So when we destroy this camera, when we change scenes, we want to make sure that it gets put back in when we reload the main menu. That's really important because if it doesn't get put back in when we reload the main menu, then we are not going to be in the spot we need to for things like character select. On the versus screen, these characters are only visible here because there's a camera and these actors are spawned in front of that camera. If that camera is not in the right spot or it's not spawned or it's destroyed too early, these are not gonna be seen on the character select. So even when we reload the main menu properly, this would be invalid if that camera goes away. So instead of destroying it where I had it, if you have your main menu level blueprint open, after load stream level, but before the remote event where we call level loaded, we were destroying the camera. That's not actually what we wanna do or really where we wanna do it because we wanna call event load level for loading any level, including the main menu. So it would be silly to destroy the main menu camera when we're loading the main menu. So we need a way to check to see if we're on a menu level before we do certain types of logic. So you can take it out of here entirely because I'm actually going to do this later on in the logic. But I just wanna show you, this is where it was. It was right between these two nodes. I'm getting rid of that and we're gonna add it in a second here. But before we add it, let's figure out how we can differentiate our logic. Now, event load level is a function in our level streaming interface. Level streaming interface is just that. It's an interface that we've included in certain files so we can call this load level function and then stream and unstream certain levels depending on where we're at and what we're trying to do. In this case, we're trying to unload or unstream the level that the player was playing on and we want to stream in the main menu. Now we want to know if there is, if we're on a menu level or the main menu level so that we can differentiate the logic a little bit because some things should be despawned if we're on the main menu and some things shouldn't. So if you click on your low level function here in the level streaming interface, you can add a new input parameter, Boolean, and I've called it is menu level. And if it is a menu level, the logic is going to be different than if it's not a menu level. So that's all you have to do in the level streaming interface is just add this one input parameter. Once you do that, you can go back into your main menu and look at your event load level. You may have to compile and save to get it to pop up, or you might even have to right click and refresh your node here. But eventually you should have this Boolean is menu level here. Remember, event load level is called any time we're loading a level. So we're gonna call it when we're loading other levels too, like coming from our stage selection screen, if we're trying to load into one of our maps that we have where we actually fight on, we're gonna call load level. And since we're on the main menu level already, the main menu load level is going to fire. But take note that when we're on something like the versus pause menu and we hit main menu, it is also going to trigger event load level. Now that's intentional, but think about this. If we load the level, then why would we wanna automatically unstream the main menu? And why would we want to destroy the main menu camera? That doesn't make any sense. We're loading to the main menu. That's the point of this Boolean. So we take our is menu level, we bring it into a branch. Now, previously what we were doing is we were just calling unload stream level. But again, this is really bad because we only want to do that if we're not streaming into the main menu currently. Otherwise, we're going to stream it in and then immediately stream it out. So only if this Boolean is false do we want to unload stream level main menu? Now this was already in here from previous episodes, but how you get this node is unload stream level, and then you type in the name of the level. We know exactly what level it is that we're going to be unloading in this case. So we can go ahead and search for that. All right, now we can do the logic to destroy our actor. Because at this point, the, we know the level that we are loading into is not the main menu, so we can get rid of the camera that it is on the main menu. Now, getting the camera is really easy. This is an actual actor within the scene. So if I go to my main menu 
and I can use the little eyeball on the levels tab here to see everything in the main menu level. I have a camera here and I've called it the default camera main menu. So you can either literally drag it into this level blueprint or you can just create a reference to it like this. Once you have this in here, you just call destroy actor on it. And once you do this, this logic that we had in here prior is only going to happen if we're not streaming into the main menu level. That is an important distinction to make and now we've made it. I'm going to go hide my main menu level again and save this. Okay, now the alternative is saying we are loading into the main menu. If this Boolean is true, we are loading into it. What we wanna do is make sure we get rid of our loading icon and then call the load main menu event. The reason we have to get rid of the loading icon here specifically is because the widgets are cleaned up in this function we made that removes all widgets. However, anytime we do a load, we spawn the loading widget. Since we are doing a load, we spawn the loading icon here. But since we're loading to the main menu and there is no other scene that opens up to remove the loading icon, we do have to manually remove it once this level is streamed in. This function is one you should already have. It comes from our base function library. Go ahead and open it up if you want to check it out. But this was part of the loading episode if you're interested in any of that behavior. So we can just call our function as simple as this, remove loading icon. And now we just want to call this event, load main menu. Once that's done, you are good with the main menu changes. This is everything we need. This will now allow us to load back into the main menu, not just at the start of the game, but coming from a scene and the main menu will function properly. With that out of the way, we can go into the versus pause menu and the versus end pop up. So the versus pause menu is this. It's just our standard pause menu. I just called it this in case we have different pause menus based on the game mode we're in. Same with the end pop up. It's just what happens when you've won the match or really if you've lost the match either way. But this is the little widget that will pop up when the match is over. Now, both of these have the ability to do two things that we're going to need to update. We're able to perform a rematch or go to the main menu from here. The versus end pop-up allows rematch and main menu. It also allows character select, although character select actually functions fine without any changes, just by the nature of how it was set up in the first place. So let's go to versus pause menu and go to the graph. We're going to go to the button for main menu. So selected main menu or on press quit to main menu button. So if you're using custom navigation, it's this event that gets called, or if you click it with the mouse, it's this event, but they both do the same thing. In here, we were unpausing the game, unstreaming the current level that we're on, cleaning up all previous data, adding a loading icon, saying we wanna load the main menu, loading the main menu, calling load level event on that level blueprint, and then setting the match state. This is actually all still valid and good. The only thing we have to change here is in the load level event, since we know for sure we are going back to the main menu, there's no question, we want to force this boolean is menu level to be true. That's how we can trigger this boolean to be true or false when event load level is called. In this case, we know it's the main menu, so we might as well just force it to be true. Now, versus end pop-up is exactly the same thing. If you go into the graph and you go to your main menu buttons again, it is all the same behavior in here, except for the last two nodes. So load level, first of all, needs to make sure that it is checked now, because if we're coming from the end of the match and we're going to the main menu, we still wanna make sure that it is the menu level. This doesn't change if it's the pause menu or the end pop-up, they both have to do the same thing. Additionally, we never called set match state at the end of versus end pop up, which we should have. So I'm going to go ahead and add that now. It's not game breaking by any means, but it does help keep everything a little bit cleaner. So I'm just going to call set match state and leave it at no state. If you watch the episode on match states, this just lets us know where we are in the game. So if we're on the stage intro, character entrances, or different parts of the fight. 
No state just means that we're on a menu before we're actually in a fight or something similar. Now the versus pause menu and the versus end pop-up are both complete. From here, we need to go into the default game mode BP, and this is where we can fix up our rematch logic. So just to give you an example, when we were playing our game before, up to this point in the series, we would play our match and we could either defeat our opponent in rematch or we could just pause the game and hit rematch here. Doesn't matter if you skip the intros or not. When we get into the game, I would only be able to walk a certain distance and that is because the old camera edges were still in place. Now they are not, so I can move freely, I can use rematch and I can actually go and attack my opponent. To get this done, it's actually very simple. We have our reset match values event here and this is what we do where we reset all of our data in the fight without level streaming. We don't unload the level and stream it back in. We just reset our values. It's actually quicker to do it this way because we're not spawning anything in here. We're just updating our values. In one of the episodes for player controllers, we fixed clearing a possessed pawn in here. And what this allowed us to do was when we performed a rematch, we had the possessed pawn cleared and reset. That way we were able to control the characters again because we lost control of them after performing a rematch the first time. At the end of this event here, we were setting is timer active to be false during the rematch and then we were bringing this into the event that is called whenever any match starts. So this is what spawns our characters at the player starts. This is what spawns our camera. Instead of going straight from is timer active to this though, I've added a little bit of logic here that is super simple. We're gonna go through, get all actors of class on our camera edge, loop through them and destroy them. We spawn new ones in the default cameras use camera function. And so we don't need to have the old ones anymore. New ones will be spawned very shortly after. So we can simply do get all actors of class we can select our camera edge class. This is your map boundaries. Your inner and outer edges are all the same class for me. So if you have different names, make sure you clear them both. For each loop, and then destroy actor. Loop body goes into destroy actor, but destroy actor, notice does not do anything else. Okay, we don't do any other logic off destroy actor, but what we do is we drag off completed and bring that into the level streamed in section. Perfect. And now you'll be able to spawn and perform your rematch and then not get stuck by the camera edges. Now let's fix the issue with the possessed pawn going rogue when we're quitting to the main menu. This is what was sometimes causing a crash if you exited to the main menu during certain times, during certain uh, FPS. Like there was a lot going on because it depended on the speed of everything unloading. It was somewhat mixed in with a race condition because depending on what unloaded first, things could crash. So there's a lot going on in that one. Let's fix up our possessed pawn and get rid of that crash. Now, the main thing we want to do is go into our code. We want to go into our base player controller dot H. Once we go into here, you can scroll down until you get to your possessed pawn variable. It is a fighter template character pointer possessed pawn. This did not have a U property tag before, but we're going to add one now because we're going to set it in the blueprint when the characters are spawned. So I just made it U property edit anywhere, blueprint read write, and gave it a category of controller. While we're here, I think I'm actually gonna change the current widget to say controller as well. It's because it doesn't really need to be tagged differently since these are all related to the controller. And we need to look at where we've set this in the past. So in begin play, we tried to get the pawn and set it. Although this won't always work. This will only work if there's a pawn existing prior to this controller's begin play. 
that most likely isn't the case based on the way we spawn things, but it is possible that this could work, depending on how you set it up. So that's okay to leave. But if we scroll all the way down to the very bottom, we have our tick function. And what tick was doing is determining if there wasn't a possessed pawn and then setting the possessed pawn. Now, this was working to possess the right characters, but the problem that was going on with this is that if things went in the wrong order when Tick was running, if the characters were cleaned up and the controllers were still present, which they were because we never destroyed the controllers, then the possessed pawn would get garbage data and somehow this cast could succeed on certain other objects in the scene. So I actually saw that a pawn got possessed and successfully casted to this class. And so my possessed pawn was like a cube in one of my levels at some point. That's crazy talk. That shouldn't be happening. And that's just because of, again, everything was unloading. There was some garbage data that was coming in here. So instead of doing it on tick, we can get rid of this entirely. You can leave the tick function with the super tick in there, but let's get rid of that. We don't want to do that anymore. We can just set this possessed pawn directly when we spawn it and we'll always know exactly what we're dealing with so we might as well just do that so you get rid of that tick and then once you do that you can build compile load your editor again and since we made the possessed pawn a u property we will be able to access it in the blueprints so we're going to go into our default game mode bp and specifically we want to go into spawn players now spawn players we come in here we grab our player starts and we spawn a player and possess it at those player starts. But I've added a few additional nodes here that now keep track of our possessed pawn variable on our controller as well. Now, in my default game of BP, if I go to my class defaults, you can see that my player controller class is a base player controller. So I was using get player controller zero here for player one and possessing. Well, I know this is a base player controller. I don't have to manually grab a base player controller instance. I can just successfully cast this to a base player controller. And it should always succeed unless I go out of my way to spawn a different player controller type that somehow grabs index zero. Since we're not going to be doing that and, and we're not going to be going out of our way to try and hinder our logic, we know that the player controller here is fine. We just need to drag off the return value, cast it to the base player controller, because the base player controller is the one that has the possessed pawn, not the regular player controller. Then we can drag off the cast and set possessed pawn, which allows us to set this value to the character that we just possessed. I know there's a lot of reroute nodes here. It's a little bit ugly, so bear with me. But we spawn a character and setting it to player one in the game mode, then we possess that pawn. The thing that goes into in pawn, the character, is what is being set to possessed pawn here. The target is the controller, because the controller is the one that has the possessed pawn variable. Now player two we do in a very similar way. I just get all actors of class, base player controller, and I grab index one here because I know that I have specifically spawned two player controllers for this instance. Even if I have more than two, grabbing index one will force it to be index zero and index one that control the characters. Then we were calling possess on that. Well, we're gonna do the same thing as we did before, except now we don't have to cast to a base player controller because we're getting all actors of class base player controller. So we know that the output array is of base player controller references. So this get here returns a base player controller object reference. So you can drag off the get and type set possessed pawn, just like this. So that's the target. You can follow the reroute nodes. The get goes into the target. What actually gets set to this value is player two. So just like above where we set player one to possess pawn, we're going to set player two to possess pawn. So you can follow the reroute nodes, it goes up and up into possess pawn. So now as soon as we possess these characters, the very next action we take is setting this possess pawn variable now. So it doesn't matter if we do it as soon as we load into the game, it doesn't matter if we exit out back to the main menu, load a new level, we're going to always know who our possessed pawn is while we have a pawn to possess. 
Then that gets rid of our tick dependency. And then we can come into the game, load up whenever we want, whatever map we want. Attack our opponents, or don't, doesn't matter. Return to main menu. And here we are. Everything's working as intended. So I hope this helps you learn about how to despawn actors, spawn them back in, stream things in and unstream them, really taking into account all the consequences of the actions of, of spawning and deleting. Because you, as you can see, I did think about it a lot beforehand. I tried to plan it out and I still made plenty of mistakes, had plenty of pitfalls in there because there were just more things that, you know, so many things get connected, they have so many dependencies and you gotta be careful does removing this thing in a certain order affect it? So all of that now should be fixed up. Like I said, there's still a few things you can actually check in the world outliner here. If you were to go back to the main menu, you can see what's spawned, what's not. All this arena geometry for me are the stages that I'm loading into the background. So for example, if I am to go to the next stage, you see that this side scroller template and this stage, these are actually 3D stages that I have in my main menu. You may not have those or you may, but all of them are allowed to be in here. So this is fine. The game state is fine. You can see we have additional controllers, which I mentioned at the start of the episode. Those will be fixed during an auto detection of controllers episode. These camera actors need to be updated, but they're part of the player camera manager, which is something we haven't covered yet. So that will also be a different episode. Same with these HUDs. And so you can see pretty much everything is cleaned up as it should be now. Looking a lot better than we were for sure. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please subscribe. It does more for myself and the series than anything else you can do. I really appreciate it. I want to give another shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon members and supporters. Thank you guys for all the love and support. I am so incredibly grateful, and I am so happy to be able to work on this series and give you these updates week after week. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. There's a link in the description. It is completely free, and I'd be happy to assist you. Anyway, guys, like I said, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.